Following a tumultuous and one-sided breakup, Melinda Vasilia found it impossible to escape her ex-boyfriend Aga Hassan. The two would eventually meet for closure, with the evening turning into tragedy of the highest level. But after friends found Melinda's lifeless body, Aga was nowhere to be found. Shortly after this, posts made by the man on the run began to appear all over Reddit and Instagram, with some of his messages triggering outrage amongst thousands of readers. But despite his brazen behaviour, officers were not able to stop him from crossing the border into the US. It would take months to finally track him down, ending in an intense trial that left a fatigued and devastated family further shattered. But what were the details that got us here? This video looks at the horrific behaviour of Aga Hassan, his turbulent time on the run, and the devastation that was left behind from his foul actions. Welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and today I have an extremely dark case with a disturbing twist. We're looking at the case of Melinda Vasilia and her ex-boyfriend Aga Hassan. By the way, if you like true crime, strange or chilling stories, then Coffeehouse Crime is the place to be. Welcome if you're new. So, if you want to support the channel, then please subscribe now. And if you want to catch me in the first hour of my videos going live, then please hit the bell notification too. And also, have you tried Classified yet? I now have my own coffee brand, so if you want to support me, please check it out. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Melinda Vasilia. Welcome to Kitchener, folks. Located near the southern tip of Canada's province of Ontario, Kitchener is a stone's throw away from Ontario's capital city, Toronto. With a population of just over a quarter of a million people, it was known as Berlin for many years before officially changing its name in 1916. But despite the change in its identity, it did not hold the city's close connection to its German heritage. And to this day, it still continues to play host to the largest Oktoberfest celebration in the world outside of Germany. Museums and art shows are a plenty here, so it is well situated for the culturally inclined. But if that's not your thing, many parks await to be visited, alongside hundreds of slopes to shred if skiing and snowboarding is more your kind of scene. Maybe it's the festive spirit in me, but it feels like fun awaits you around every corner here, and no matter what your taste, you will find something to entertain you. But sadly, these lands also hold some dark memories. In April of 2016, in a field just 60 miles southwest of Kitchener, a farmer came across the gruesome discovery of eight bodies. It turns out that these eight men belonged to one of the local gangs, which had been at war with another gang in the area. Now, I won't go into the details of this case, but this tragedy left eight families mourning in what could have been an entirely avoidable incident. And in short, all of it boiled down to what the judge described as meth logic. Just out of curiosity, but if you are interested in hearing more about this story, then please please let me know below. Anyway, beginning our story today, it's in the city of Kitchener that we find Melinda Vasilia. Melinda June Vasilia was born on June the 28th, 1994, to her mother, Anna Todorovic, and her father, who wishes to remain unnamed in the media. And to complete the family of four, she also grew up alongside her sister, Christina. Although not much is known about her childhood, Melinda was known to be a bright young woman who is loving, honest, forgiving, and kind. She was also known to have the loudest laugh in the room, and apparently one that was highly contained. She was a humble woman with nurturing plans. She wanted to become a hairdresser one day and eventually marry and have kids whenever she met the right man. Many of us come to such aspirations eventually. Me personally, I would eventually like kids, but for now I'm happy just being a full-time cat dad. For Melinda though, she knew she wanted kids from a very young age. And perhaps she was hoping for such a thing when she met a man named Aga Hassan. Now, Aga was a resident of Hamilton, Ontario, and was of Iraqi descent. His parents had moved to Canada from Iraq to escape the Kurdish genocide, starting a new life in North America. Melinda and Aga immediately clicked when they met. A friendship was very quick to blossom between them, and it wasn't long before they became romantically involved too. As most relationships tend 
plans to go, it all began idyllically. But over the space of just a few months, and at this early stage, cracks suddenly began to form. To begin with, it was things like arguing, bickering and disagreeing, the usual suspects. But over time, those issues became more concerning. As the relationship approached its first year anniversary, their difficulties would come to a head. To the point where Melinda made the decision to end things with Argo. The arguments were beginning to get out of control, and deep down, Melinda knew that there was no viable future to be had with him. Too much hostility had grown, and it was sadly time to move on. But unfortunately, Argo did not take this decision well. Soon after this, Argo broke into Melinda's home through a patio door. Unfortunately for Argo though, both her roommate's brother and boyfriend were in at the time, and let me tell you, they were not pleased. Amidst the tense confrontation, police were called to the property where they then arrested Argo. He was eventually charged with two counts of assault, and one count of breaking and entering. He was later released on the condition that he would not approach or contact Melinda. But, in typical Argo fashion, this was another thing he refused to accept. He continued to barrage her with messages on a very regular basis. But despite Melinda leaving most of these messages unanswered, he doubled down and became more emotionally riled. Despite the tense situation, it was clear that there was still a lot to address and close off between the two of them. And so, on that note, Melinda agreed to meet up with him in order to figure out how to move forward. But you see, even this detail had issues. Although she felt like this was something that needed to happen in order to move on, it was clear that she was still concerned for her safety, to the extent that she asked her roommate Anna, another friend, and her sister to be in the same house when he came over, just in case things went pear-shaped. The night in question here was April the 27th, 2017. It was during this evening that the group waited for him to arrive, but strangely, he never actually showed up. With the evening dragging on, Melinda allowed her friends and sister to carry on with their original plans that being to head out to a local club. By the time the group had arrived back home at the apartment, it was just after midnight, meaning that the date had just progressed to April the 28th. But upon entering the apartment, the first thing that they noticed were shoes that they knew belonged to Aga, sitting just outside of Melinda's bedroom. And in addition to this, they could also hear the sound of two people talking inside. Melinda's friends shouted out to her to ask her if she was okay, in which Melinda replied yes. And after feeling satisfied that there were no indications that anything was wrong, they texted her to ask if she wanted some food, since they themselves were planning to head out soon. Melinda replied that she was fine and didn't feel hungry. And so, relatively comfortable that she and Argo were okay to be alone, the group left the apartment to grab a bite. By the time they returned home, the time had just passed 2.30 in the morning, and when they eventually walked back into the house, they were met with a sight that would haunt them for the rest of their lives. Melinda was lying on the ground, surrounded by a pool of her own blood. Two bloody knives lay by her side. She had been stabbed multiple times, and, tragically, it was clear that she was already dead. In a state of panic, the group frantically knocked on the door of a nearby neighbour, and after checking for vital signs on the phone with emergency services, they couldn't find a pulse. The arrival of emergency services would only confirm what they could already see. Tragically, Melinda was dead and, as it turns out, she'd been stabbed a horrifying 47 times. It was obvious to everyone who was responsible for this. Argo was already known to the police, had previously broken in, was the last person to have seen Melinda, and had already proven himself to be violent. And the spotlight shone even brighter on him when they realised that Argo was nowhere to be found. He had simply vanished into the night, leaving a devastating crime scene behind. As outrage and pain ripped through the community, the police made it their number one priority to try and track him down. But despite their best efforts, Argo was nowhere to be found. And it soon became apparent that if Argo was responsible for Melinda's murder, he didn't plan to hang around in Canada to explain. Although a surveillance camera had captured him and the car he was using on the night Melinda was killed, he was captured a second time when swapping out the license plates in a parking lot after crossing the border. And with this information, it wouldn't take the authorities long after this to pinpoint the exact time and place where he left Canada. At around 6am of the same morning of Melinda's murder, his vehicle was recorded crossing the Peace Bridge located east of Lake Erie, which connects Ontario to Buffalo. And shortly after crossing the border, that is when the 
internet became involved, because shortly after this, strange posts began to appear all over Reddit. In these posts, Arga gave his own grievous version of events, and although they were promptly removed and the account was deleted, it was all too late, because many people had already archived these posts. And just as fast as those messages disappeared, Arga Hassan himself would as well. Several days later, and to begin negotiations, he contacted the police on WhatsApp. Argo said that he would turn himself in if he had some sort of deal in place first. But without any sort of deal coming into fruition, he once again vanished after these messages. Now, this was no small accomplishment here. Argo had successfully evaded the law, and unfortunately, this wouldn't be the last time either. He had vanished into the lands of the United States, and all detectives could do was hope that he would eventually message them back. The next sign of life from Argo would be two weeks later on May the 20th, when he claimed that he'd been photoshopped after being wrongfully spotted in Tennessee. And then one month later on June the 19th, three more posts would suddenly appear. Slightly different from the rest, these two were merely images with captions which explained his feelings. Despite this, no matter how hard detectives and data forensics tried, they simply could not pinpoint his position. And despite multiple points of contact with the officers, he would continue to evade the law. Sadly, with every day on the run, further distressing Melinda's family and loved ones. But finally, on July the 10th, 2017, progress was suddenly made when Arga posted on Instagram Instagram. In this post, he said, I'm coming home. It's time to end the dark path I've been traveling, and give people the closure they deserve. Saying that, he wouldn't post this without some half-assed vanity photo. I'm unsure if black and white was for deep, thoughtful, dramatic effect, or to simply enunciate his jawline, but either way, it just screams how tone deaf he was in the moment. But despite this post, Arga didn't actually turn himself in. Instead, he was finally arrested as part of a counterfeit investigation. His phone was identified and tracked after buying counterfeit currency via the dark web, with officers arresting him just one day after this Instagram post. And this isn't the end of his terrible time on the internet either. Oh no. In fact, it would get much, much worse. It was later learned that, while still on the run, Argo had opened a Facebook account under a fake name. And under this fake Facebook account, he would actually go on to message Melinda's mother, and in addition to this, would go on to join at least one group that was dedicated to Melinda's memory. In a direct message to Melinda's mother, he wrote, Just an outsider looking in, sorry about what happened to your daughter. However, it seems like this could have been avoided had you not let her stay in the apartment after he broke in the first time. Partially your fault, yes but I hope you can forgive yourself. We all make mistakes. This one, however, cost your daughter's life. Oh well, you have other daughters, right? He would then go on to post on the memorial page saying, this is what happens when a whore dates a douche. Murder. Although there was never any concrete proof that Arga had sent these messages, it is extremely likely, because after tracking down the IP address, it was proven to have been sent from the same house he was hiding in. And as you will soon come to realize, there is much more evidence for the court to use later on. The timeline on the night of Melinda's death has never been fully agreed upon. However, using the information and evidence available, we can generate a pretty thorough understanding. Despite legal procedures already in place to restrict Aga from meeting Melinda, the two had chosen to meet up and speak again in person. Although Aga missed the initially agreed time frame, he would eventually meet Melinda after her friends left for the evening. And after arriving back at the property, her friends were satisfied with the conversation being calm enough that they did not intervene, and furthermore, left to get food. Sometime between the group leaving and then returning, it is clear that the situation between Melinda and Aga began to rapidly deteriorate. Argo claims that he did actually plan to be at the property while Melinda's friends were there, but would accidentally arrive late. Following the conversation, surveillance footage captures Melinda walking Argo out of the apartment and to his car. In this footage, both of them seem to be calm and comfortable with each other. Melinda then goes back inside, where Argo pauses for a moment before then following her back into the apartment. According to Argo, their conversation had gone very well up until this point in time, but he 
hadn't yet fully shared his story with her. On that basis, he decided to go back inside and confess that he had cheated with another woman in recent months. Shortly after 2am, a surveillance camera captures him running to his vehicle before speeding off into the night. And just 40 minutes later, the other members of the group returned home. According to his Reddit post, Melinda allegedly lost her temper after learning of his infidelity. He claimed that she began to slap and hit him, and eventually, he pushed her back in self-defense. Depending on whether you believe him or not, but Arga claims that she grabbed a knife from the kitchen and began to stab him with it, inflicting several wounds on his hands and wrists. He then claims that he, apparently, quote, blacked out and when he came back around, she was on the floor. He allegedly thought that she had just merely passed out, and then he fled the scene. He then texted her phone, saying how glad he was that they had made up, and everything was good between them. Before then, of course, for no reason at all, speeding off towards the US-Canadian border. I am remaining mostly impartial as always, but honestly folks, I am struggling with this guy. As a side note, Arga's Reddit profile was named Red as Blue 101, which leans into the whole red pill blue pill ideology. I do think he was just trying to sound smart and edgy, but it could also be nihilism. Anyway, with Arga being on the run for so long, and in the end not even giving himself up, he had a lot of work to do to convince the jury he was innocent. But before we get into the legal proceedings, let's reiterate a few cold hard facts. While on the run, he had been in contact with the police multiple times to try and negotiate some sort of plea deal. In fact, the very day that Melinda was murdered and he crossed the border into the US, he spoke with a detective via WhatsApp. The text message read, Detective, I did not attack her first. She came at me with a knife after I revealed to her what I did in the past. Things were good. I was in her room for an hour just cuddling and kissing. Even asked her roommate. When I came back to get my keychain, I told her the truth. She then went for the knife. The version of events that Arga described seemed to be at odds with almost all of the evidence that was brought up during the trial, and Melinda's autopsy revealed that she had been stabbed a total of 47 times. The cause of her death was determined to be sharp force trauma to the neck and chest, with more than half of those 47 wounds made to her neck. No surprise, Argo continued to paint the picture of self-defense during his trial, claiming he had only retaliated while trying to protect himself from a supposed crazed ex-partner. He claimed that she had grabbed the knife out of nowhere, injuring his hand and wrist in the process. However, the sheer number of stab wounds that were inflicted on Melinda made it very difficult to believe. I mean, it is one thing to defend yourself. But 47 times? The forensic pathologist who carried out the autopsy believed that just two of the six stab wounds have been fatal, and this means that the other 45 were all simply overkill. She also stated that the wounds on hands and arms were typical of self-defense, or at least were wounds that were typical of someone being attacked and trying to protect themselves. Arga insisted that he had feared for his life and merely blacked out, and was therefore unable to remember his actions. During his trial, he said, I remember stabbing her twice. I was overwhelmed. I just blacked out after that. When I regained focus, there was blood everywhere. I didn't expect to lose control like I did. When Arga was given the chance to address the court, he said, I genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, apologize. There are zero excuses for taking one's life. I cannot and will not forgive myself. During his trial, text messages between the pair were read out and shown to the courtroom. One from Arga saying, I never did and never will physically hurt you in any way. Another read, I don't want to get over what we had. If anyone tells you our relationship was toxic, they are wrong. Yes, we fought a lot, but it's only because of our cultural differences. But I was slowly starting to change for the better. We can work out any situation, as long as there was no cheating or hitting involved. And yeah, I hate to break it to you, Arga, but you kind of failed on both of those factors. The final text message sent by Arga was sent at 3.39am, which was roughly one hour after paramedics arrived. And this text message simply said, Nice seeing you tonight. Glad we worked things out. Anyways, see you soon. The prosecution would ultimately suggest that this was just a poor effort to cover his tracks while he made his way to the border to flee the country. They would also highlight that this cute text message was sent only after he'd stabbed her almost 50 times and then left her for dead. No surprise, Arga was eventually found guilty of murder in the second degree, defined as intentional killing without premeditation in the Canadian Criminal Code. And so, as a result, he was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 16 years. With this being second degree, 
first-degree murder, Arger could have technically received as little as 10 years behind bars if his parole was set accordingly, but thankfully, the judge set this at 16 years instead. Although Melinda's family were happy to receive justice, they were rather disappointed with what felt like a relatively short sentence. After all, with the time he had already spent in custody taken into account, he could theoretically be out of prison as early as the year 2033, putting Arger at the still young age of only 41. Many of the delays seen before his trial were due to the court system shutting down due to COVID-19. But this was also further exacerbated by Arga changing his own legal representation. To add to this, the evidence created and messages sent while he was on the run were kept out of the case by the prosecution, which also seems odd. It was made clear in the court that, although there was no doubt that he was the one who had taken her life, the exact circumstances behind it have never been fully agreed. Following his sentencing in September of 2023, Melinda's aunt spoke outside of the courthouse on behalf of the family. In her statement, she said, The past six and a half years, it's been hard, emotional, aggravating, upsetting. It is never over for the victim's families, especially for us. Melinda is gone forever. She's never coming back, and I don't agree that he should even be allowed eligibility for any type of parole. On these words alone, you can see how strongly they felt about his sentence. One of the most unique aspects of this case is Arg's decision to put his own version of events on a public forum. It is crazy to me that he felt confident and sure enough in himself to do that. Messaging Melinda's mother under a fake name to tell her that it was her fault that her daughter had died while simultaneously calling her a whore is one of the most evil and sick things I've ever heard. I just can't get my head around that. That shit is just depraved. And feeling cocky enough to call out the police on Instagram while also on the run is just bitterly funny too. Even after murdering somebody, he is out there victimizing himself like a true narcissist. And this black and white photo and quote to show that he was somehow a good little boy for handing himself in really was the cherry on top. The protracted legal proceedings once he had been apprehended, as well as the information that was kept out of the court case, is also fairly unique. The prosecution was looking for a conviction based on the crime that had been committed that night, and at that moment, they didn't want to muddy the waters with extra information that was essentially irrelevant. Although there was some backlash over his sentence, it is worth noting that if they did charge him with murder in the first degree, then the prosecution would have had to prove that he had travelled to Melinda's house with the premeditated intention of killing her, which, as you can imagine, would have been quite difficult to prove. And sadly, no matter the charge or the sentence given, Melinda's death is something that cannot be undone. She was a young woman with an entire life ahead of her, murdered at the hands of a man who claimed to have loved her. Her death has left a massive hole in the lives of everyone who knew her. And in court, her mother spoke about the life goals that she would now never experience. She would never have the opportunity to have children as she'd dreamed about, and would never be able to experience the joy of growing old. Her mother spoke of how the light had gone out in her own life, how she was unable to hold down full-time work or even visit busy areas. Melinda's sister, her aunts, and her friends all described her as beautiful with a vibrant personality, that she was caring and loving and would do anything for anyone. Her obituary pages and the various groups and fundraisers on social media are full of platitudes where anyone who crossed paths with her had nothing but great things to say. Her life was cut short by a man alleging to love her, a man who had already proven himself to be unstable and and impulsive by breaking into her house. A man who was under legal instruction not to even approach her. The time he spent on the run, and even his defense that he tried to deploy, was nothing more than an attempt to smear the memory of his victim. Thankfully, it was an effort that was in vain. Every once in a while, I come across a killer that just really gets under my skin, and Arga definitely is one of them. Hope he spends many years behind bars. Anyway, folks, I think that pretty much wraps up our case today. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate you being here. Before you go, though, I do want to know what you think about this story, because, at least for me, 
This one was just sick and twisted. As always, please let me know what you think in the comment section down below. I try to read most comments and I try to reply to all in the first hour. If you'd like to support me in the channel, then please consider subscribing. And on top of that, please check out classifiedcoffeeco.com. If you'd like to get early access to my videos and want to support me for only $3 a month, then please check out my Patreon. I really do appreciate that too. You can also catch me on social media where I try and post pictures of myself and Nero and our adventures. And yeah, I'll, I'll leave the links here. Anyway, once again, that is it for me today, folks. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, I'll see you again very soon for another video. Until that moment arrives though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.